start. Uh, so, uh, good evening and, um, and welcome to the third in our series of webinars. And I'm William Stockdale, or Bill Stockdale, Chair of Thornley Street History Group. Uh, we're delighted to welcome tonight's speaker, uh, community ar archaeologist, Dr. John Kenny. And John uh, will be talking about the historic landscape of a medieval moated manor site in the Vale of York. Uh, John will gladly take questions at the end. Uh, they will get moderated, but just type them into your Q&A box um, and uh, we'll do our best to, to answer your questions when we can. So I'll now hand you over to John. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Bill. Uh, I shall just uh, bring up my screen here at home. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed um, for inviting me. It's a real privilege to uh, to join you, and um, great to see so many people coming in on um, on Zoom. It's absolutely fantastic, and uh, really nice to be part of um, keeping people interested and entertained through this um, this lockdown period. So. Nice to see you all here. So I'm going to be talking about what in the big scheme of things might seem like quite a, a small project. It's a, a, little, um, a little community project um, in a, a small village south of York, um, looking at um, in particular the moated manor site um, in the village, but maybe also taking in a bit of the landscape around and about. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to um, talk to you about, first of all, how the project came into being, because it's a project at the moment with no budget, um, a group who are running it uh, have not formally, formally sort of come together and created themselves into a group with a bank account or anything like that. But we're all working on, on this, so I think that qualifies as a project. And what I'm going to do is, is talk to you a bit about how we came together and how we managed to find ways of, if you like, forming the phase one of the project, which was to see how much we could get done for nothing. Um, a little bit of help from me, but you know, uh, it was surprising how much we managed to get done through um, through the first lockdown. We had a bit of ability to get out and about and do a few things as small groups in the summer, and then of course we're back in lockdown again now. So I'll make a start. Um, and the first thing that I'll do is uh, just say a little bit about our site itself. So it's never been previously investigated um, and that was something that interested and excited the group um, that was coming together. Um, one person who, who had kept cattle in the field for a while had, uh, had reported after the great storm that they found pottery. Um, under the uh, um, under some of the trees that have fallen down, some of the willow trees you can see in this picture, that is actually where the moat site is. You can just about make out the moat going around the outside, and these big willow trees um, are uh, um, are the inhabitants of that moated site now. And a couple of those on this side were blown over in the great storm, and that revealed some pottery, which you know. For a moment was an exciting and interesting thing within the community within a, you know the people who saw that pottery so back in the autumn so moving into the winter the um the, key, the leading figure if you like in in the project brian Worrell from skipwith got in touch with me and said uh, i hear that you've been doing community archaeology with um in particular groups quite nearby there's a group at north duffield um just up the road where brian elty um uh, these projects there and I've been working with him for what 15 years um, on projects at North Duffield and so um, Brian Worrell, two Brian's right next to each other, um, suggested to me that I might like to um, come and talk about what we were going to do. Part of his motivation was Brian works and he had a six month career break coming up so he had six months off at the beginning of 2020. Absolutely perfect. Um, it's actually from about March onwards, I think. So he was really looking forward to something to do. So we went out, had a few beers, had a, a talk about what we'd have to do as a community project. We talked about the fact that it's a schedule ancient monument. What does that mean for us? Um, we talked about how we were going to, how they were going to learn to do archaeology. And we talked about the possibility of, of of them learning from me um, 
and then they would be able to carry on and do certain amounts of, of, of project work themselves. But obviously learning from me, I don't mind going along and chatting, and as you can see, I don't mind going out and doing a bit of geophysics and the odd thing for nothing. Um, but if we're going to get a project underway, then, then we need to also find a bit of funding to pay for professional support as well. Um, <clears throat> we had a good, a good, off to a good start um, in that we had a very supportive landowner. They own a lot of land around Skitwith, um, lots of the common, which you'll see in a bit. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they were interested in uh, giving us an opportunity to display fines and things like that. So that was a good start. Um, it's always a good start in the pub. <clears throat> so what were we starting off, off with? What might this project look like? Well, for us, the starting point, and it will be the starting point, I think, if we were going to go and apply for some funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund, for instance, who are um, the main funders of these types of projects, really, um, you know, the, the starting point is the archaeology. There's no doubt about that. You need to have at the core of what you're going to do um, uh, some good archaeology, something that's interesting and exciting um, and is going to interest and excite the local communities. Um, so we had that. We felt that the, 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 the moated site um, was really interesting. Uh, the local, local people, Brian and his friends, were really interested in it, had been for a long time. And it's worth pointing out that in some respects that moated sites have gone out of fashion a bit academically. In the 50s, um, Le Patrial spent a lot of time classifying moated sites around Yorkshire, excavating them, um, and a good many have become scheduled. Uh, but since then, not an awful lot of research has really gone into them. They've, they've just gone onto the back burner of academic archaeology somewhat, and nobody really is building housing developments on top of these uh, these scheduled monuments so they've just sat there and the people who are interested which is what i'm really excited about as a community archaeology archaeologist is the community that's the thing that really fires me up um, so what we thought was if we had a uh, a group of enthusiastic volunteers who could be trained up by committed professionals then that would be a good starting point and we could really get some archaeology done that way. <clears throat> so how do we pay the professionals? Well, obviously we really need to go out and get some a budget. We'll need specialists to teach people, but we also need people still to, to do pottery reports or maybe to process, oh, not necessarily process, but to analyze what comes out of environmental samples. So there, you know, there is a place for the professional within this sort of work. Um, and it's brilliant what they can do for you. But that means you need some money to, to do it. We need to add money to our enthusiasm. But it's much, much more than that. Okay, community archaeology, in, in some respects, this is kind of where I come in, really, because it's quite easy to, to look inwards at your archaeology, get that little group of buddies together who are really interested in the research, and then not take it out and blow the trumpet to everybody else in the community. And there's lots of different communities out there. Uh, obviously, we would still train the enthusiasts, enthusiasts um, so that we had a proper team of people to, to look after whatever archaeology we were going to do. But we need to engage the rest of the community, and that might come in a load of different ways. Um, it will, would be reaching out to people. Some people are naturally interested. There might be people who are naturally interested, but they don't think that they can get involved um, and that's for many different reasons a young person like in this picture she wouldn't think about it because she'd no awareness of it but actually she really enjoyed she's actually telling us in quite a lot of detail about dinosaurs and things there she must have spent an awful lot of time at a very young age learning about dinosaurs but anyway um, i think i managed to get over the point that archaeologists don't find dinosaurs um, but there's lots of people who think it's not for them. We're not welcome because we're not professional. We're too young. We're too old. Some people are very, very interested, but they feel they're not old enough to go get down on their hands and knees and dig holes. But they might be interested in sitting um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a washing up bowl and cleaning pottery. So there's lots of different things that people could get involved with 
who might still have that, that natural desire to be involved. But then there are people even more on the outside of, of things. People, you know, large numbers of young people you need to get involved with schools. Um, and primary schools always, seems to me anyway, have always welcomed me and I was teaching to a primary school online in Thorn this afternoon. Um, you know, they're, they're more than welcome. It's much more difficult with secondary schools because they're focused in on their, on their exams all the way through secondary school. But primary schools, they can get involved and, and do things. So that gets young people interested. Um, and, uh, but there are other pe people who have learning difficulties, people with mental health issues. And I think this might be quite key for our project because although there are a number of people obviously who know they've got mental health issues, there's lots of other people amongst all of us who have some mental health issues and we're gonna have more coming out of this lockdown. So actually that seems to be a great opportunity to get people out of their houses when they can get out and start doing things and going on walks, going on historic walks around the parish of Skipwith and maybe others nearby. It's a, it's a wonderful landscape. Um, coming along and helping with field work, um, maybe coming along to, to lectures and talks and courses and workshops and things like that. Lots of things we can get people out and about doing and getting involved in the project. So it's, it's that whole thing of getting inclusive. It's not ticking boxes for the Heritage Lottery Fund. They'll see right through that straight away. It's not about ticking boxes. It's about doing it because it really ought to be done. And that's what I'm committed to. Um, and there are benefits to the community. I've probably already said a little bit of this, but you know, um, we don't want to exclude people. Um, some people just won't want to get involved. And that's fine. They can't, you, not everyone does everything. You know, just because I think archaeology and the history are the most interesting things in the world doesn't mean that everyone, my son, avoided doing history at school. You know, it's what daddy does. I don't want to do anything with that. So, you know, it's just one of those things. But we don't want to exclude people. We want to give people the opportunity to see that real wide variety of ways of getting involved. And that then brings forward the opportunity for the funding. So the Heritage Lottery Fund would be interested, I am sure, in funding a project that was well designed, that went out of its way to reach out to people, particularly maybe people with uh, you know, loneliness issues in a rural setting like where we are, or mental health issues, things like that. Um, there are even contacts now with local GPs where they employ people to go and look for activities for people with mental health, health problems to do. And they've never been taught, I've never talked to them. I don't know where, how many community archaeologists have. Um, you know, they all go and do gardening projects. Well, now it's time for them to come and do some archaeology, I think. Um, <clears throat> but you need to get that money from HLF to buy the specialist help you need. Um, we've been quite lucky in, in our area because actually, although I live just south of York, and I, I live in York, but only just in the field, um, in a house, yeah, I'm not just sitting in a tent. Um, but uh, um, in Selby, they have a community engagement forum that gives small grants. We've managed to do some community archaeology on these smaller grants from the community um, engagement forum, um, and uh, that's you know that's been a real benefit to community archaeology in this area. Um, so we had all these great ideas, you know, the speech that I've just been giving, I gave to Brian. Um, and uh, I, I think he, he took it on board and he was interested and excited by the idea. I didn't put him off. I didn't send him into his shell thinking, I just wanted to look at this with just a few of my buddies. You know, he, he was up for doing it. And uh, I don't know, but that's the sort of thing that, you know, if you don't want to do the schools, I think they have got an ex-teacher who hasn't, you know, who would like to go back and do more stuff with schools. But, um, you know, those are the things you say, okay, we've got some money, we'll pay John to do it. Um, you know, so they can get on with doing the things they like to do. Um, so we took this train the trainers approach. We were talking about that when, bang, COVID struck. Um, I also then found that I had a throat cancer that needed urgent treatment, which luckily was successful. Um, but it did mean that for the first six months, six to eight months of um, 2020, um, I was out of action, um, but I did manage to find someone to help 
Um, it was, and it turned out to be really quite useful because this chap I've been working with in Howden on the um, uh, on the, the, the Bishop's Palace in Howden, um, a guy called Stephen Lonsdale. At that time, was an undergraduate student at York, <clears throat> and, but he just applied to do a PhD with York, um, looking at moated sites. Fantastic! So Stephen came along and um, and helped out by going along and having a chat with uh, with Brian and the rest of his of his gang um, after lockdown started to, to dissipate. Um, and then in the summer. Uh, I always thought it might come back, you know, it's a bit like the flu epidemic in the 1900s, you know, have to look at everything with a historical perspective. You know, it's going to come back strong, and, uh, sadly it has. Um, but in the summer we felt like we might be coming out of it. And so we ran a couple of workshops about moated sites um, and about geophysics. Um, and that was me, me being able to make my first tentative steps in sort of a, August and September time, making my first tentative steps to get back into work um, and doing things again and waving my arms around and entertaining people. Um, so, so we got past COVID. Sadly, we also got past Brian's um, Brian's six months off were just very convenient for his employers. So, uh, so he didn't really get a chance. He built a boat. That's what he did with his six months off in the end. He built a, a, a dinghy, a sailing dinghy. So what did we manage to do through that summer? Well, as I was saying, I came back into hell. Um, but none of the funding opportunities have really kicked back in. Heritage Lottery Fund were, were funding what they called um, uh, what they called emergency cases. So these were cases of um, uh, where they uh, uh, whether you know the, if they didn't do something, the, the place was going to fall down. Um, and so funding for the, the more normal sort of uh, everyday heritage project like ours weren't happening. Um, and the same went for the um, community engagement forum. They didn't officially close, they just stopped meeting so they couldn't issue any more grants. Um, <clears throat> so we set about trying to see what we could do for free. Um, effectively, that became phase one of the project. Um, so we started to try and see this moated site in its bigger landscape, um, undertaking some geophysics, um, which allowed us, you know, there was only six of us, so we never had more than six at any one time, and we were all work working um, socially distanced from each other, um, and uh, no, so we managed to fit the bill uh, to try and um, build a better picture of the value of this site um, for when we did apply to the Heritage Lottery Fund, because we still need to establish an archaeological value that, that we could understand. You know, they, if it turned out that the most valuable thing you can do is leave it alone and protect it, um, then they probably wouldn't uh, give us a grant. So we have to say it's valuable, but we could learn a lot more about this site. Um, <clears throat> The map there is uh, is the 1891 map of the village of Skitwith, but I'll tell you a bit more about Skitwith as we go along, so you'll become quite familiar with what looking what we see there. It, it is an interesting village, though. If you have a quick look at it um, along there, if you can follow my arrow, my pointer, um, it's basically there's the moated site with a uh, still full of water because it's quite low lying and very flat where we are. When you first come to Skitwith you think everything's completely flat and then after a while when you've been living in this landscape for a while you start to see slopes and, and hills and valleys and things like that and people who live in real hilly landscapes think I'm completely mad. But, uh, but the, um, the, the, in, the, um, in the southwest corner here is the moated site you can see it's got a little building on top of it and a lot of trees. Um, in fact, that's an orchard on there. And the little building was built after the main medieval buildings had gone. Um, it was a, probably built in the 1800s, um, but we don't know exactly when. It's been and gone. So actually, there's a job there to try and date when, when it might have been constructed. Um, but the village itself is, is long and straggling. You've got a village green at this end with a village pond. And at this end, there's a sort of string of houses which include a school, 
a Methodist chapel, a pub, the Hare and Hounds, uh, which is now the Drovers, but it's still a very nice pub when it's open, obviously. I'm thinking that the town's houses are the, um, they're equivalent to a poor house, this row of houses along here. But then along here, it's effectively a whole group of farms that have all been, have all come in. Um, and th these originally, they would have been tops and crofts here when it was a medieval village. But what they've done is they've just developed their tops and crofts into proper farmsteads. And so they're farming the land about, around and about, but living in these farms so that you've got a real sense. And, and a number of other villages in, in Yorkshire are like this, that it actually it's a cluster of farms without too many other houses. There's not much, much other people are going to do. Um, in some cases, you know, the farm workers, um, rather than being in little cottages, are actually living in the attics of some of these houses. You've got, there's the moated site. I'll come on to it again later, but the, the main manor house, if you like here, Skipwith Hall is there now. And that's its grounds. And then over here is the vicarage built at the time when, um, back in the uh, Victorian period, when they invested huge amounts of money in, um, into the uh, into the church into rebuilding churches and building grand vicarages that the poor old vicars these days can't afford to heat um you know they've got eight bedrooms and they only need two and that sort of thing and there's the church and then one last farm and then a separate little hamlet little skip with just off the map there but I'll, we'll go we'll go through a bit more of the landscape because that's one of the things we were trying to work out and learn more about so <clears throat> the first thing we did or um, for describing um, this, so was we tried to get a picture of Skipwith in its bigger picture, um, and um, I always find that this wapentake, which is a um, an administrative um, sort of uh, plot of land that takes in a whole bunch of parishes, um, and by the time you know they, they still exist, but they don't really do anything now. Um, uh, but they did, they, they did have a purpose for things like raising, um, raising armies and that sort of thing. Um, the, the, it takes in um, a large area of the landscape south of York. So the city of York is here. And then you've got a whole set of parishes. But it's really, really convenient. This is a really convenient wapentake because running down the east side of it and cutting in half that parish at Catton, um, is the River Derwent, which is perfectly navigable all the way up. Stamford Bridge just sits outside at the top. And there's a whole other talk all about the Battle of Stamford Bridge and the Battle of Fulford and the Battle of... Um, uh, so there's two great battles all took place on this side of the river mostly. Um, down the River Derwent until it joins the River Ouse here. Just on this side of the river is uh, Wrestle Castle. And then there's the River Ouse going the other way, up here, past Selby, there, up past Spoonfleet, up to the city of York. So it's neatly packaged between two rivers. And then running along the top is the York Moraine, uh, which is a glacial moraine. It's one of my you know, famous hills that doesn't seem like very much. You, you can feel it if you cycle up it, mind. Um, you know, and the views from the top aren't too bad, but it's not as if it's a Scottish mountain range, really. But nevertheless, it does form a convenient boundary on the top of this shield-shaped um, uh, weapon tape. And right in the middle, coloured in sort of pale pinky colour, is our parish or township of Skitwith. Um, I'll try and talk about townships because um, a township is a much better way of thinking about a medieval um, uh, community than, for me anyway, than a parish. Because a parish is about, about church administration, um, whereas a township is the sort of the actual land that the villagers would have thought about when they say, where do you come from? I come from the township of Skitwith. Um, I don't come from the parish of Skitwith because that includes North Duffield, who are arch rivals. Um, uh, and in fact, North Duffield doesn't have a church, um, so they all have to walk from North Duffield to skip with to go to church. I'll get my car now, so it's not bad. 
Um, it's a, a village, a medieval village that had um, quite a large proportion of common, which is still there now, which is rather nice. Um, it kind of it, it, it skipped with common in the south end of the um, of the of the township here, and that's still common today, and that's owned by the landowners who own our um, our moated site, which is about here, opposite the church. <coughs> um, I'll just go back one slide for a second. So that common is then shared with Rickall, and also Osgoby, the north part of Osgoby there and a little bit of North Duffield, and it comes up in a big loop and goes into Thorgan Rivers as well. So actually, it's a communal common as well. And they would have divided it up with these other settlements, these other townships, about who had rights to go and take animals onto the common and do other things. You know, occasionally they do, they, they do a bit of growing a few crops on there. There are lime, uh, lime uh, ponds and things like that, all kinds of activities on the common. But as far as the medieval um, village goes, then it had a field system, the classic three field system, of which this map was drawn up by the Victoria County history folk. Um, and they based it on a map from 1769, at which point the north field is relatively small. The west field has a separate little field here, half ray. South field, and then a moor field here, a bit of Ings, which is um, uh, sort of their, their own private bit of marsh. Although the water drains down this way, I'll show you this later, it goes out that way. These large areas of, of the township weren't common though. In fact, when we look at the LIDAR, you can see the traces of ridge and furrow right across these. And in fact, what you've got is much larger fields in the full on medieval period. This is 1769, they've been eroded um, through time uh, down to these fairly small fields for a relatively small um, uh, population to work on. <coughs> so this is, the, I've taken the, the map there from 1769, or we did, I didn't do all this myself, um, uh, of 1769 and we imposed it onto the LIDAR pictures. This is a a lidar picture. It's um, it's one of the ones where it shows the trees and things. So it's not perfect for finding uh, um, for for finding sort of faint traces of archaeology. But the thing it does do is it gives us a really good picture um, of things like you can see here all this ridge and furrow on the landscape. Some of this this is all inside the township. This is in the township of Rickall next door. The other thing that I found really interesting, and I'll come back to this in a bit, was actually when you put the rivers on, so this river, and it's only a stream really, but times like this where it's just been snowing today, they're quite full um, and they operate now as drains and they've been straightened in places to make drains. But actually these are the rivers that are the, the last remain. So it goes this way now, but the LIDAR shows quite clearly that it used to go down that way. And then this river, which actually drains from Skitwith, goes down to meet it. And I wonder, let's put a dotted line there with a question mark, that's the Ing. So it's possible that actually the river used to go that way and join down there, a separate little tributary. But this long straight dike has been cut to take the water straight down to what's now called the South Dike. Um, and this is the South Field area here. <coughs> so, you've, but you've actually got areas of lowland. So this is the highland. It looks like mountains on lidar. It's fantastic. This is the highland. This is where people are living, and then they're still able to cultivate these lower lying areas, but they will be more prone to flooding, especially if you go back a thousand years, because what's been happening is that silt has been building up in this landscape over many, many years since the last ice age. There have been changes in, in sea level and changes in the, in the degree of power behind the rivers pouring out. As the, as the sea level was still quite low, because lots of the ice was still bound up in the ice sheets uh, you know, further north, uh, the sea level was lower when the ice was melting to start off with. And, um, and so the water that was melting off the, uh, off the glaciers really carved great big, thick, uh, great big 
canyons into the into the um, into the landscape, particularly down the River Ouse and the River Derwent. The little rivers we're looking at in Skipwith, they're actually more like what you find on the beach when the, when the, when a lake dries out, because actually before this lot, uh, before all these rivers formed, there was a massive lake here which only really um, started to drain out when the ice melted in the in the Humber estuary and it could flow into the uh, into the North Sea. So there's a giant lake, then the giant lake drains out, and these are the this is the drainage pattern of huge glacial rivers um, that carve deep into the into the um, into the landscape, about eight meters deeper than what you've got now. The River Ouse carved down, and it's filled back almost to the top of the valley now. So those eight meters, you to find a Bronze Age log boat in the River Ouse Valley, you have to dig down about six meters. To find a Viking Age ship, maybe that was left behind after the Battle of Fulford or the Battle of Stamford Bridge, sorry, you'd have to dig down two meters to find that. There's the, it's been filling up with silt. And so my theory, at least, is that these little streams here would have been more pronounced in the past um, and that they've all silted up over the years. And now they become more just sort of drains for the landscape where they would have been probably navigable by people in, in log boats and things back in the past. The red bits of the roads, the common I've traced out in green. Um, so it just it gives us a picture of the landscape in which our little moat lives. So how do we know what was going on, you know, after that ice age had gone? Um, I, I almost feel that there was a time when people didn't think there was much life going on down in the in the Vale of York. Everyone thought that everyone was living up on the walls and uh, the antiquarians and uh, um, and archaeologists even in the early 1900s were were really sort of working on the premise that people couldn't live in the Vale of York because it was uh, too boggy. And there are definitely areas that were too boggy. And I think actually, and I only really thought about this when I was going through my talk, is this picture shows the red lines are, are where aerial photography has been plotted onto a map. Yeah? So these red lines are boundary ditches and even round houses in the top um, north northeast corner there and if you come down to the bottom lots of enclosures here and a, an amazing enclosure there of which we know nothing about no one's investigated it we don't even know whether it's iron age or Romano british but it's a very good bet that most of it is iron age Romano british although when we look more closely at some of these areas we do find that there are some bronze age burial mounds and in fact, there's also a Bronze Age um, uh, bank and ditch that you go up on the walls down here on the common at Skipwith. So lots of people living here, but they're living on the higher ground. And if you flick back to the LIDAR back and forth, fix in your mind where those red bits are. The red bits are all up here and all here. They're not in this bit. And I think the reason they're not in that bit is that's the bit that's prone to flooding. And so either they're there, but they're buried under much deeper silt, or in fact, they weren't there because people used that as a, as a, as a marshy resource. Coming right up here, um, people were using that as a marshy resource and not living there. But they were living extensively and very actively on the higher ground. So just glibly saying, oh, it's all flat and, and boggy down there is wrong. There's lots of big islands of um, good ground, usually with sandy subsoil, so fairly easy to work um, across this landscape before a village formed at Skipwith. If any, the, well, we don't know whether there are more of these red lines under here because you can't see them because someone built a village there. Um, but the village is on the higher ground, and that only formed um, really once you get into the Anglo Saxon period. Just going back to those. Um, uh, burials and uh, the there are a number. If you look on this 1851 um, map, so this is the first edition Ordnance Survey six inch map. You've got up here, you've got Danes Hills, and those are burial mounds. Danes Hills down here, tumuli, 
and more of them over here. They were taken to be um, burials for the by the antiquarians. They were taken to be the um, the burial grounds of the Vikings who died at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, um, on being taken away from Stamford Bridge and buried here on the way home to get try and get back on their boats at Rickall. Also, I've just marked on with yellow where we've got triple banks, which are just like the triple banks you see up on the walls. So this landscape is populated with Iron Age and Bronze Age action. I like to think that the waterways in the area are also important um, means of transport in those early periods, in, that, in, the, in the Stone Age periods for, and the Roman period, um, really coming up to boats start to get start to get a bit big after the Roman period. But um, whilst people are still using dugout canoes as a sort of basic Ford Fiesta sort of you know bog standard vehicle to get around, um, that you could get a long distance up and down these rivers paddling if you know the tide's right and everything. But certainly you can move up and down these this river system. And there's our rivers here. This is a water board picture. So they've all got numbers. Um, and uh, some of it has been straightened out right there to make drains. So I just have this kind of theory. There's no more than that. And what we need to do is think about how we might research this idea as part of a project. Do the project, do people in the project think it's worth researching? You know, it's actually an idea that's bubbled out of my head. So they might say, oh, John, I don't want to do that. I just want to dig the moat. The thing that gives us that idea of when the when the village started to come together was the church really in the first instance because the church um, has a, a large amount of Anglo-Saxon um, the, the bottom parts of the of the um, of the tower are Anglo-Saxon um, and um, there's been a fair bit of archaeology done on this because although it seems it's out on the sticks out in the countryside actually there's a mine at Rickall which went underneath Skipwith and caused enough subsidence that they had to do underpinning. So they've done a lot of work on the church and actually quite a lot of landscape survey and other parts of the landscape, but they've never looked at the moated site. Within the church, there's quite a number of blocks of millstone and gritstone. So all these pink blocks here, this is drawn by York Archaeological Trust, um, and the green are are all um, either gritstone or um, and so what you I might call millstone grit. It looks like that when you look at it, but technically it's a gritstone. These are the favoured um, stone building stones of the Romans, not the um, not not medieval folk who prefer to use the Ulysic limestones, which make up the the sort of um, the bits in between. So actually, um, what what uh, the guys at York Archaeological Trust are saying is you've got a big Anglo-Saxon, this is a plan, Anglo-Saxon tower that's reusing a lot of, of Roman stone, which is really interesting. Where's that Roman stone coming from? A new question for us to ask. Well, how did the church come into being? Um, well, an awful lot of these parish churches, a, lot, a, little, a little village is forming in, in the Anglo-Saxon period. We, it's got skip with is an Anglo-Saxon um, name, so it does appear in the in the Doomsday Book, um, and uh, we we find that quite often the Anglo-Saxon leaders, when they first set themselves up as, as lords of land, um, they're often um, sort of still pagan or or maybe just only just reaching the point of conversion, um, and they and they they start to donate land to the church to build their churches on or at least to put up a praying cross. And so it looks like, um, we don't know this for sure, this is pure speculation, that um, the church then is donated land by, um, by an Anglo-Saxon Lord, and they have the church built here. So there's a question then, it's very often the case that they have their hall quite close to the church, because they want to be near this church that they've invested so much money in. So somewhere in this area, we were wondering, and we still wonder, whether or not there's actually an Anglo-Saxon hall. It's a big question mark. Part of the evaluation, the archaeology that was done um, as part of the church work, they did put in a, a, a trench across here and found nothing, but they didn't do any um, geophysics. They hadn't done anything 
that might give you a bigger picture. Just one stab in the dark trench, um, which didn't find anything, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something going on there. So we've got another question to ask. Have we actually got um, a Anglo-Saxon hall near the church? If so, it's not going to be down here in the south because that's too wet. It could be up here somewhere. You've got a little tributary running down here through this way. So really th this area is the best bet for them to build a hall. So we'd like to know that. Where did the Roman stone come from? Well, um, I think I think Brian and the guys at Skifford would like to think that there's actually on this higher ground over this way, they would like to think there's a villa that no one's found yet and that's where the stone came from. But there's a trackway coming through here that might have ancient antecedents and there is, although it's never been excavated, but I found, managed to find it on the aerial fo fo photos, there is a villa down here in Rickall just missed by a massive water pipeline project but they didn't pick it up um, but it is that it does appear there on google earth i'm pretty sure there's a villa there that might be a job for the rickle local history society so i'm wondering whether they put it on a cart or a lot of carts and ship all that grit stone up through here but you know they're both equally possible theories and um, you know what we want to do is uh, is think about it a bit more at least Put them down in writing even if we can't if we can't if we can't excavate the villa and find some of the stone there and match it with the stone at the, in the church some people suggest there's a viking influence within the church you've got this graffiti within the tower it's very difficult to make out a number of people have suggested that it's viking and suggested it depicts ragnarok now Ragnarok, I won't read all that, but it's basically a kind of end of the world um, scenario where lots of the gods get wiped out. But in the end, some of them do survive and you get and you actually reach a point where you get a bit of an Adam and Eve situation where two humans survive as well. Um, and this was taken to be um, a, almost a, just a little, a little illustration of Ragnarok. But when you draw it, um, I don't know, these guys charging around there's there's only, there's only one monster there's supposed to be lots of monsters that come out and attack um, and so other people like Simon Jenkins who wrote a book about the thousand best churches he suggests that the Viking idea is pure speculation um, and he purely speculates that it might be Anglo-Saxon and it might be a bear hunt that this animal might be a bear it does look a bit like a bear it's got a long tail I don't know what the natural historians think about the length of that tail but it might be a wolf as well, which might fit in more with the Viking age. But you know, the Vikings were in the area after, you know, at the same time as the Anglo-Saxons, um, you know, in the early medieval period. It could be either, I don't propose that we're going to answer that, but it does allow us to know a little bit more that we do have um, this sort of early medieval church here. Then the Normans appear on the scene. They carve out this landscape which is then what we start to see here um, and uh, the field, three field system we've talked all about that already really they invest money in rebuilding of the churches so they, they start to rebuild the church in Skitwith um, they don't build a new one but they do add on um, transepts and naves and things to the church um, but they do increase the agricultural output and I would like to bet if we do field walking around these fields that we'd find quite uh, distinctive sort of York wares, North Yorkshire wear, gritty wares and things that would, that would sort of typify that period where they're putting a lot of effort into um, uh, improving the agriculture and improving their, their income from these villages that they've had. Um, they were building lordly seats. I'm not suggesting that the moat was anything like Wrestle, which is the Percy family seat of many and mu much smaller than some of their other castles. Um, down where the point where the Derwent reaches the ooze. You've got, they build Mott and Bailey castles, um, partly as, as their way of conquering the landscape. They don't do that at, our, at Skitwith. Skitwith's tiny, um, but um, just along the, on, on the river Derwent, just on the other side, there's, um, there's Orton, where they build a Mott and Bailey castle, and next to it, they build a nice um, moated site, 
which does look a very much look very much like our motion site. The only difference is they've got a modern Bailey Castle too, but we can't have everything. Um, that was the Mortain family, and later the Asks take on autumn. The Asks have quite a lot of influence in our in our patch. Um, they organise meetings of people um, quite near Skipwith whilst during the Pilgrimage of Grace. So that's quite quite an interesting little um, link to the Pilgrimage of Grace there. They also build uh, these moated sites. There's lots of them around. Six thousand are known in England. They usually got a wide ditch, um, sometimes not always filled with water. Sometimes um, the island is just used for horticulture. Other times they build a house on it. Um, they can be quite prestigious. Um, sometimes they might not ever be lived in by the actual Lord of the Manor, but they might have a steward there who's looking after their interests locally. Um, the peak of building these is between about 1250 and 1350. Um, and they really stay in use right through until the sort of 15, 1600s, when they're very, by then, very unfashionable. I don't buy into the idea that they're about defence. They might keep out a band of three or four sort of raiding Scots, but any determined um, army could get across these moats and attack them. And, the, and we've got evidence of them doing that further north when the harrying of the north, uh, with the Scottish raids. So what do we get by trying our geophysics? We were able to socially distance. Uh, it didn't take more than six people. We were in tier two, so um, you know we were able to get out with a group of six. Um, the dog didn't count. The dogs, as far as I'm aware, don't get COVID or carry it. Um, but the dog was very helpful, very attentive. And this is what we got. Now, what we've got here um, put onto a map um, is that's that blue bit is where the building from the 1800s is with another little one there but we do have quite clearly in dark here um, areas where resistance is lower that lower resistance means it's a bit damp and we take these low resistance areas in these long straight lines to be beam slots that would have held up a building so you've got a building possibly going north south or possibly it actually goes under this building and it's covered over by all the demolition from this building. It might go that way still be even bigger. It might have a courtyard in the middle. The white areas we think are, um, are rubble. We did a little bit on this side of the moat just to see if we could see evidence for a bridge. And we do think that these dark areas might be other beam slots that allow a bridge to run across. Whether it was a drawbridge or anything fancy like that, we can't tell. But there does appear, do appear to be beam slots that will allow for a bridge to go here. Is that slot part of a little gatehouse? It might be. And then these lighter areas might suggest that going along the side, the edge of the, um, of the moat, they might actually, it might actually be walled in stone, which would be nice if there were some stone parts to it. So we've, so we've got some archaeology done. And we can now show to the Heritage Lottery Fund or anyone else who might question whether or not it's worth digging. We think there's something to look at there um, and we would like to know more about it. We had a go at flying with a drone, but most of our grassland, most of our area is under grass. So there are the odd lines here. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a fish pond as well here. That's our moated site. But the grass is just patchy. There's a, a pond there. We couldn't really see anything obvious with our drone shots, but it was something else we could do as part of our phase one. And so we were glad to do it and there was no cost to it. This is just looking again. It does bring out the odd line, but they look a little bit like they might be drains. Um, these bit, that doesn't really match up with any fields that appear on the earlier maps. Look, this, this map is 1800s and that's just all there's the boundary at the bottom, look. There's no, um, there's no earlier map field on there, but that might be that there was one there in the 1700s. We did a bit of looking at the historical background. It told us that Skipwith was an Anglo-Saxon name for sheep farm, um, that it was slightly smaller than North Duffield, which North Duffield had a market, and we also now, had a small, now know it had a small castle, although not many people know that. Uh, it's privately owned. Um, there's a lot more to find out about that. Um, 
but Skipwith was the parish church. So Skipwith had the parish, North Duffield was a slightly bigger village with a market. Um, and the common is often referred to as the Lord's Moor. So it might not actually be so common if the Lord, if the Lord has got control over it. Um, it passed through a number of owners. Um, There's a guy called Baldrick um, and the bishops of Durham um, and the D'Avrange uh, family until, in fact, um, in about 1400, the Skipwith family take it over. So it's not Lord, the Lord of the Manor isn't the Skipwiths until quite late in the medieval period, which is quite interesting. So we've got some interesting snippets from the history. There's a lot more to be found there. And that's good stuff that people can be going away at who don't want to get their, their knees dirty. It was the home of the Skipwith family, so that's a great link. Whether they lived there, we don't know, but we do know they had a portable altar there in 1454. So it had some importance for them. Um, and the house appears to have survived right up until the 17th century. But in about 1657, um, it was being described as prostrated and demolished. So it's gone from there and a new house appears just over the way. 1672, we know it's there then, a nice new manor house. Um, and that's the home of the Lords of the Manor now and the landowners now. So uh, very, very, very helpful. Here's our map again, just to remind you of how the village works, but we've talked about that already. So what have we achieved? Well, we've got a picture of a general timeline for Skipwith. It raises some questions we'd like to know answers to about, you know, um, did the Skipwith actually live here, that sort of thing. Was there a manor house on the site? Well, we think there is now. Is there an Anglo-Saxon manor? What's the quality of the house? Quality of the house, is it? upmarket enough to think that the Skipwiths lived there and maybe some of the others. Um, what about the house and buildings that, um, how were they arranged? And how well is everything preserved as archaeology? We've no idea yet, we've just got that picture, we've just got the geophysics, we don't know what that represents. And so the first thing to do is actually do small scale excavation to find out, amongst other things, to find out what the state of the archaeology is to evaluate the archaeology a really important phrase because we're going to have to get permission not just from hlf but from historic england we'll need to get scheduled ancient monument consent to do this we have to get a section 42 agreement from them to do the geophysics so we've really got to show in um, historic england that we mean business and that we're going to be this is going to be a community project not just a bunch of uh, of people that, you know three or four of us who are interested so what would we like to achieve? This is my last slide. Um, and uh, I think I've probably talked about a lot of these things already. But what I'd like to say is we would like to find some feed seed funding to help us gather a bit more information about the local community, what interests them, before we make a bigger bid to the HLF. We're looking at a local authority to maybe supply this, either through the SEC um, or maybe even through other funds that they might have. We'd like to work with people um, who living in rural settings like ours who are experiencing loneliness. We'd like to bring them, you know, bring them a bit of joy to their lives, doing interesting things. We want to build group links with the groups and organisations who support the older people and uh, people with learning difficulties in the area. Um, we want to make links with the local primary schools. We'd like to undertake more geophysics in the area between the church and the moated site at least, if not the bigger area, to see whether we can find evidence for an Anglo-Saxon um, uh, hall and maybe also um, more village type housing rather than the farms that you see in the map that we looked at earlier. We'd like to do some test pitting or maybe even small evaluation trenches on the moat, on the, on the on moat platform to see how well the archaeology survives and what we might expect if we did a bigger excavation. All of that means we need to develop our relationship with Historic England. We'd like to start a programme of local history walks and talks and also I'd quite like to run a book club um, in which we can look at books that you know, medieval historical novels that involve moated sites, see how how writers have described these things. So that's what we'd like to do in phase two. It's very ambitious. 
Um, some of it relies on us finding some funding, um, but that's how, we, how we've got so far. So I'm going to draw to a close there and see if we've got time for any questions. I've overrun a little bit there, so I do apologise, but let's see if we've got time for any questions. I'll hand back to William, I think. Right, John, we, we have got some questions. We, right. we, we've got a similar um, moated site. Yeah. What do you what do you think we could do there? Because we can't get access to our site either. How how do you think we should proceed? No, it's very it's um, it's one of those things where you need to go along quite slowly. You need to build the relationship with the landowners first. How do you get on with the landowners? They're very supportive, but not at not at the moment because oh, of okay. COVID. yeah. So they're probably a bit worried about all this COVID and all the rest of it too. I mean, I would. I would suggest one of the first questions to answer is actually, do you think there's anything on it? Um, if it's like ours and there isn't a great deal of historical stuff that you've managed to dig out yet, um, you know, was there a house there? And I, I think, did you talk to me this about before once, Pam, where you were saying uh, that uh, that some a, a well a, a, f a fairly important figure did visit the village, but we don't know where they might have gone. So is this actually, you know, does it have these odd moments? where they this descended upon um, and if there if so you need to know whether there's a house there really so getting on there to do some geophysics would be the start and it's quite a lot easier to get a section 42 license from English heritage or sorry historic England than it is um, the full ancient monument consent to dig to dig so it's a little bit at a time I think and trying as many different approaches as you can to build up information about the site but I know, I know you've got a geophysics kit, so it's really just getting on there and finding someone to hack the brambles down for you, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Right, there's, an, there's another question. Uh, somebody says it su seems surprising that a high status house would have been built on such wet ground, but are you yeah. anticipating good organic preservation on such a site? Yeah, that's quite interesting. And it's actually one of the things that we, we really picked up when we were doing the landscape study. And, and just standing there and looking is actually the the that the moat is actually cut into the side of the hill so so there's the church up here and then it drops away I'll make my it's it's not a big valley okay but it drops away down to the south to the south dike so where that river runs through and the and the, the moat is actually dug into the side of the hill so that the so you walk out onto the moat that way uh, and then it's dug into the it's dug into the so it's flat and level but um, the moat is deeper on this end than it is at the top end well it, it's not deeper it wouldn't fill up then um, but it's uh, it's kind of dug into the side of the hill it's a very slight slope um, and so they are actually they are up out of the floodplain um, but the floodwaters particularly maybe in the past would have come up um, to fill the fields below them you know the fields where we were saying oh we can't see anything on the drone pictures it might be that we can't see much there because that's more prone to flooding but the floods don't come all the way up the side so they're actually out of the floods they're on the edge of the higher ground um so that's perfect for them another question how how would you go about testing the idea that the rivers were more navigable in the roman or early medieval period yeah yeah, so, so other people have done work on the, on the River Ouse further south, and so Robert Vans North in particular was his humble wetlands project. He did come up the Ouse far enough to, to establish those depths of silt I was talking about in the Ouse. But there is a question about, all right then, but these little streams don't have great headwaters, so there's not so much water flowing down them, although there would have been a lot to start off with as the lakes drained out. Um, so what I'd propose to do that would be to actually take core borings in transects across these river valleys. Um, and so we'd core down through the sediments and actually build up a picture um, of, the, of the shape of the river valley beneath the sediment. And so we could then measure the height of the sediment. Um, I haven't really fessed up that this is a horrendously labour-intensive uh, labour job. <laughs> and it's very, very hard work. <laughs> Unless you can afford to buy or hire in a um, a, uh, a mechanical um, corer, which is what the geologists use, 
And I haven't looked at how much those are. Um, they might be within our scope, I suppose. If you put it into a budget beforehand, that would make life a lot easier because I've done some coring in the winter in some pretty grim conditions and it's hard, hard work. <laughs> right. I think uh, that's about it for questions. So I'll hand over to Bill. Thank you, Pam. Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, John, um, fascinating stuff. Um, really enjoyed it and uh, we look forward to working with you again and possibly even get you out to have a look at our medieval moated site. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah, let's hope for better times. Okay, so we hope everybody's enjoyed tonight's presentation. Uh, we do welcome your feedback as it's only because of that that we're able to try and find the right things that you want to hear about. Um, we've also got to say a few other thank yous, especially to the Lottery Heritage Fund, because they've helped us provide the finances for tonight's webinar. Uh, I'm going to plug our book again. It's still around. We still have some copies. Details are on our website. Or you could call me or my wife Anne on 01845527717. I'll kindly send you a copy and relieve you of a small amount of money. Uh, next webinar, next week, Thursday the 21st, when we've got Jim Brightman, Solstice Heritage, and Jim's going to be talking about traditional farm buildings of the Yorkshire Dales. Another fascinating subject. So until then, please do keep safe and well in these difficult times. Good night. Thank you, Amanda.